Max, what's wrong? Hmm? Am I going to tickle feet? No? Not your deal? Hey, you. My name is Jason. I speak Portuguese. And this is Max. And Max, earlier today, was up on top, enjoying himself, and just feeling in a destructive mood, and decided to unscrew the little fastener, like he likes to do. And then once he gets those unscrewed, he likes to lift off the carabiner and drop the toy. And then, go down to the toy later on when I let him back in, and then like lift and play with it like trying to get it up. I'm wondering why in the world it isn't there. Why, well, Max? You trying to give me a five? You want to give me a five? You got it? So Paul Shepard, Thinking Animals. <clears throat> the book I was assigned in college by just this wonderful hippie professor, Art Homer, right before he was going to retire anyway. So, you know, and it's, it's just the concept of uh, I think it was written in the 60s. Paul Shepard was at Yale? No, University of Georgia, 78. So, anyway, discusses how evolution has evolved within organisms. And he does a great job of using the metaphor of different animals to kind of show how your thoughts move in general. Um, and I just, I loved it. But what really blew my mind about this was his discussion about brain to body ratios and how that plays into intelligence as well as the sort of the social network of the organism and how that plays into intelligence okay so we've got brain to body ratio uh that's not necessarily not too much brain or too much body it's truly the what's bad bound Kako is a border collie Kako means chocolate in Portuguese, because I can speak Portuguese. And Kako definitely genetically knows that her biggest goal in life is to you know, herd. You know, to, to, to this is master. I want to do whatever it is master wants of me. So often we'll go outside and Kako be excited. You know, hey, we're going to play. Great. She's going to grab the ball. She's going to be running right around. We'll get a lot of energy out. It's awesome. Toby, on the other hand. Toby. Toby, come. 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 Come on. No, come. Toby. Toby, come. Come. Toby, come on. You know, let's go outside. He's a little terrier chihuahua mix of some kind. He's a street dog. Okay, they're both from Sao Paulo. We, that's, before Veridiana and I went down to Sao Paulo, she got me this shirt. Uh, you know, just on the back, I know it's a sweet gesture, but on the back it says, if found, please return to, because she was certain I'd get lost, and then I, I did get lost, but I didn't get lost. I mean, I just, you know, took an hour to go what should have been like seven minutes. But by the time they came as a search party, I was already back on the block, and they were, you know, freaking out for an hour, but I was, I was back, so... I don't think I was lost, but they think I was lost. But anyway, she had a double yellow head when she was a little girl. Okay, when she was like 12. Loved it. It only liked her and kind of liked her mom occasionally, but her brother, whoo, all the time. So I had a former coworker of mine who about this time last year said, hey, my father-in-law is going through a lot of issues. Kako. Go outside. Go. I need to get rid of a parrot. Two cages, everything included, just we just need a place for Max to go. Double yellowheads live about 80 years old. We estimate Max to be about 20-ish, 23 maybe. Uh, I think, if I remember right. So he's, you know, testosterone prime of his life. We're thinking about trying to figure out if he wants to get a little 
cellmate. But he'll come out every once in a while and hang out with us in the office. Most of the time, though, all he knows how to do is, if there's testosterone close, I'm going to attack. It doesn't matter the fact that I gave him an almond earlier today and that I'm offering to fix your toy. It's just, it's chemical. So what I'm getting at is it's not only brain to body ratio in some organisms that you can find a, you know, carrier chihuahua mix or a border collie and their personalities. You've also got a, uh, an organism in birds and I think reptiles in general. It's chemical. Okay, so in, in, in amphibians, frog sits on a lily pad. You just kind of fly comes by, tongue goes out, captured, sucked in food. Cool, right? Well, there's no brain activity in that. The neuron from the eye is directly to the tongue. So shape of fly, not. Hmm, am I hungry today? I'm trying to make my best current frog voice. Hmm, am I hungry today? Hmm. Okay. One kind of step above that is that you have some brain interference, brain mechanism in how you think and process, but it's still chemically driven. It's not a, it's, it's, it's hormones. Okay. And I mean, we can say the same thing with ourselves. We're very much chemically driven in how we feel in our mood and our emotions, right? But we have that next layer, right? And then you get mammals and then you find that brain to body ratio and family concept, nurturing the young, all of that sort of thing, warm bloodedness, the freedom for that. What's interesting to me is that their life, I should say, didn't necessarily develop a concept of three dimensionality or depth or space as well. You know, you think about if you only could see, well, that image is, it's going to be kind of three dimensional, but you know, it's going to kind of be flat, right? Well, reptiles had horrible hearing. The mammals were scared t to death, literally, of the reptiles because they were big things stomping around, some little itty bitty things, itty bitty mammals, go and hide in the night. And they become nocturnal. And in doing that, eyes expanded quite a bit, but hearing became the big thing. And the, the brain's ability in mammals to conceptualize space through hearing caused kind of a three-dimensional blooming in consciousness, really. So as much as this guy's a jerk, and as impossible as he is to please, I can't blame him because he's chemical. And as a individual who uh, has ended up getting in a lot of trouble, evidently, um, I can understand what it's like to be chemically driven. I can understand where irrationality, because you've got that chemical, like, hormonal need behind it. And so, yeah, I, you know, go on fine. I'm very honest. I asked, you love Max? You know you love him. I said, no, I tolerate him because I know you love him. But, you know, he's kind of fun to watch every once in a while. Especially when he is dumb enough, he's just gonna throw his toy on the ground in a fit and then expect me to go and get it for him after he's <laughs> all day, right? So, interesting to me, that, that blooming of consciousness from insect I mean, flower to insect, you've got that, that biosphere to flight, you know, insect to amphibian. It's, it's neural in a way, but it's not intellectual in any way. You've got reptile that's, that's sight driven and primarily whatever hormones going on inside of them, regulated by the sun. And then you've got mammal evolves develops three-dimensionality, develops space, develops warm-bloodedness, which allows for brain-to-body ratio to really thrive, Deve develops a sense of kinship that you can, I, I think, I haven't really tested it back into the dinosaur age, but if you look at the later part of the dinosaur age, you finally get these, 
these dinosaurs that have evolved to defend their nests. So defend the young kind of becomes it instead of just, you know, like an amphibian, it's just plop them in some sand and bury it and go back to the ocean, right? I mean, what else are you going to do? Survival of the fittest that just because I've got an abundance and plenty of it can be food. But then you've got this uh, mammalian concept of family. And then we get to humans specifically with regards to apes. Uh, Tay Hard Dash Jardin is one of my favorite. Uh, just, he, he just has given me so many uh, little thoughts to build around, right? He's like a skeletal figure of consciousness, what happened in evolution. You know, this is a Jesuit mystic priest whose writings were banned <laughs> because he didn't focus enough on seventh-day creationism and original sin. We'll get to that in a different video. But uh, thankfully, he had given enough. He had enough respect and friends that he just handed out all his work, and he was prolific in what he published. Um, he just wasn't allowed to technically publish until I think he was dead. I know his books definitely not. Um, but when you read those. You get to this point where, I mean, think of evolution, okay? We, as mammals, the ape family in general, at some point back then, we didn't specialize. These aren't fins for swimming. They're not wings for flying. They're not claws for digging and grasping. They're not hooves for climbing and balance. It was kind of like like early hominid primate. It's kind of like, we're going to hold off. Let's see what we can do just kind of waiting and figuring out later, right? Pretty soon if you you know how the structure of the jaw evolved, Denis Lenoir up in Montero, because I know Portuguese French. They had they shiny. I don't know, very down I can do it, it makes me sound ridiculous, but Denis Lemoy, up in Ontario, was a dentist. And when he kind of realized that the rear molars had to have shrunk in order for the cranial capacity to enlarge just enough that we have a brain-to-body ratio that's just slightly more, enough more, than the chimp. And he said, that just, man, that... <sighs> okay, evolution's the way. So he went and got a PhD in evolution, biological evolution, you know. But on that way, he'd been raised Christian, and he was like, ah, oh, you know what? This, is, this this God of the Gaps theory and some of this stuff that just, mm, no, I don't think that's true. So then he went back and got a <laughs> doctor in theology. I think he really just wanted to rack up his student loan debt, but that's on me. He's a good dude, though. He really is. I met him uh, right when I came back from our, uh, our Afghanistan here. A decade ago or so. So anyway, <clears throat> brain to body ratio, molars, the opposable thumb, that's not just the only thing that is differentiating. I think it's really interesting that we went from almost upright to just always fully upright. I like to think that what we're really doing is processing the energy that's going into the earth. But that's a new, you know, whole new topic. So, but it allows Max and I to get along. That kind of understanding, you know? The more you know. You know, like you, I, when I was a kid, you'd send that little star. The more you know, and it's like, ding. So, anyway. So, Toby. Street dog, Sao Paulo. Verdiana fires him at the jockey club in Brazil. She's a veterinarian. <clears throat> and he runs the jockey club. Man, I tell you what. He is the king of the jockey club. All the Jockey Club strippers come and pay Toby homage. And this little turd, yeah, what? You want this? Why don't you go back up, son? This little turd, yeesh! You want up here for a while? Mm -hmm. This little, dang, you're gonna go off. Alright, alright, dude. Alright, alright, back it off. What? You might fly. He doesn't fly too often, so. I just let him wander around the house. I'm going climb back up. So anyway, Toby, he, you can't keep him in. We've got a fenced-in backyard. He jumps, climbs a tree, whatever. I mean, so all the neighbors around here, right? 
I'm, I'm apologizing. I'm like, I'm so sorry that we can't keep our dog in, you know. And they're like, oh, Toby? Oh, no, Toby's cute. Like, what? He brings home treats. I'm not encourage him. You know, you know, the neighbors on the next street are going, yeah, well, like your dog, yeah, well, he makes rounds over here. Because he doesn't do his business in our yard, of course. Mm, yourself. Mm. And so yesterday we were explaining, not yesterday, about a week ago or so, we were explaining to these neighbors up on the other side. He's like, yeah, I mean, I know for a fact he makes his rounds over here. And we're like, Look, I'm sorry, it's a rental. We'd love to fix the fence. We'd love to do more. He's a street dog. There's nothing we can do, you know. And you can chain him up and he won't go anywhere. He won't play. He won't nothing. He'll just mope by the back door, you know. But that Chihuahua Terrier mix is pretty interesting. And it's really funny. He's got a little tick on his back feet. So, like, when he's running back to you or running away from you, it's just tick, tick, tick. It's like he's skipping, okay? <laughs> You see him up front, of course, you're like, Toby! And he looks at you like, oh, there you are, what have you, he just comes right back, you know? He's a sweet dog, he doesn't bark much, he doesn't really, you know, everybody loves him. You know, even the guys that he's turning in their yards, they're like, yeah, no, he's a good dog, he's cute, and we tell him that. He really likes our dog, like, yeah, no wonder. So they each have their own little quirks. They each have their own what we label within our organism a personality. There is that much interiority, at least in mammals. And I would venture to say also in birds. I don't know that there are always just these turds, but to be fair, Max is, we're not in the best spot right here. We would rather have him in an open place in general. Right? So what he's doing right now is hormonally driven. He's this is his only area and he's just protecting. So he'll be this aggressive sometimes, sometimes even with Mary John around here. What? But with me, yeah, it's any time I walk past, he's going, hey, you're not supposed to be nibbling on the wires. You know that. Quit. Anytime I'm around, it's like, yeah. It's lunge. It's lunge and lunge and lunge. And that beak is not dull. That thing will puncture right on through you. And at the same time, interestingly enough, it's not always just puncture, puncture, puncture. Sometimes, he's kind of gentle even. He's just kind of chill, does his own little thing. Yeah, see? Now he's like, wait a minute. Hey, you don't nip at me. Wow, you must be pissed. All right, you want to go inside? I'm trying to fix your cage, dude. Go back inside. Quit messing with me. Do you want me to fix your cage? Do you want me to fix your cage? Yes. I know, yes. I don't know what you want me to do. I'm trying to fix your cage. You are preventing me from fixing the cage. You're doing everything you can and just come at me, bro. I really wanted to name him, rename him, come at me, bro, but we'll see. Max is fine. And uh, as far as I know, his mother and father are doing well as well. So that's good news, isn't it, Max? Yeah? Can you calm down yet? You've got everybody wondering if I'm going to catch it in the eye. Don't worry, if I do, I won't edit it out. I'll show how just vicious you are. Yeah, I know. Now what? No, you can't get to me unless you want to come. There we are. Dude, you are not helping. Okay, that's it. I'm not going to crush your feet. I want to. How can I hang it back up if you keep attacking it, dude? There we go. No, 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 no. Inside. Come on, dude. What? Okay, you want this or not? Yeah, okay. Then, then go inside. That's all you got to do, dude. It's okay. Come on. There we go. Now at least you're off of there. So now I can do this. See? If found, please return to. If killed, please return to. That's Max's deal. Hey. Ooh, I'm almost quite ready. Almost. Never thought I'd have to wrestle a wrangle a bird before in my life. But I've done crazy stuff. There we go. Now somebody can be happy. Okay. Now, you ready to go inside? 
There we go. See? It's not so bad. It's not so bad. Yeah, we're 